Yeah, Jim, oh, we're just um, setting up. So just give me a couple of minutes so we can um, allow other people to come in. And if you have any questions or if you have any um, issues with the images or the sound, just let me know. Okay, we're going to give it a couple of minutes. We're, we're streaming on YouTube as well, so we're just going to let a few people uh, check in. Okay, this is the Arika page on a website. Okay, this is the Arika page on a website. Okay. Okay, so your GMO greetings, yet I say to everyone who is tuning in. Um, this broadcast is something we wanted to do to update people and inform people about our upcoming tour to Kemet and Kanit, Egypt and Nubia. So, for those of you who are unaware, I am Ojirafo Kwesi Radneh Mata Akan, Ojirafo of Akpamu Man and Maruka Tifimu, the Akpamu Nation in North America within Ojiraman, the purified nation, Afurakani, Afurakani people, African Black people in the Western Hemisphere. Um, we have been conducting tours since last year. So we did a tour to Kemet, and you're going to see the videos from that um, last year in May, from May into June. And then this year, once again, May. 23rd through May 31st. However, some people were not able to attend the trip that's, that's next month from May 23rd to May 31st. They weren't able to attend that trip this year. And as you can see here on the webpage, we have the spring tour, May 23rd, May 31st. And then we also established an autumn tour, which is the same tour going to the same places, but it's simply a second tour in September uh, 26 through October uh, 4th. So for people who couldn't make it in the spring, then we have the autumn 
version of the tour and it's the same tour going to the same places. So we want to focus on that and the places that we will be going and show you some of the information that we will be covering. So first of all, uh, let me grab something real quick. Hold on one second. So first, as you can see on the page, this is our flyer for September 26th through October 4th. So we call the tour Ari Kat. And as you can see, this Ari and Kat, this is the spelling of Ari Kat in ancient command. Now, Adi means to make or to do. Hat is a term for soul, divine consciousness on the feminine side, but it's also and cause the male side and so forth. But ka and kat to kat also means the specific function, things we are to do, things that are formed or fashion, certain you know ideas, actions, labor, work, the divine work or toil or function that we are to execute in creation. Now, we also have the term kat, dealing with the soul, divine consciousness, the, the spiritual force that animates the black substance of space, ka and kaido, ka and kat and so forth. When we talk about adi kat, what we're talking about is the formation or the making of that which is created. We're talking about the cosmology of creation. And we talk about Arikat in the context of the cosmology of creation, because when we go to these different sites, we wanna understand the cosmology that undergirds the sites, the different divinities, the Ntoru, Ntoru to the deities, as well as the Aku, the Aku to the spirits, the ancestral spirits, but the deities, the Ntoru, Ntoru to misnomer Neturu, Neturu, but Ntoru, Ntoru to the goddesses and gods, the divine spirit forces in nature, that are housed in these specific shrine spaces. These are shrines, specific shrines for different divinities. Shrines in ancient Kemet as well as in ancestral culture in general are special um, structures that magnify the energy of a divinity. So if you set up an ancestral shrine at your home or a shrine for a divinity at your home and so forth, that is a specific place that's established that is created and structured in a fashion that resonates at the frequency of the energy of the divinity. And that spirit will take up residence in that space temporarily to communicate directly with you. It's no different. Your, your physical body is a shrine for specific divinities through spirit possession. The spirit comes down and possesses and operates through your body to communicate with the community. If you're a priest or a priestess or someone who is a, you know, a medium, for the ancestral spirits or deities and so forth, you become a living shrine at that point to carry the energy of that force to communicate through you to the community. When you establish a physical shrine at your, your space, a shrine for a divinity or an ancestral spirit, they take up residence temporarily through that physical space to communicate with you through that specific space. It's a means by which their energy is magnified in a specific space. We always use the example of if you have a, you know, a magnifying glass, if the sun is shining, shining on some dry leaves on the ground, the leaves are just warm. If you place a magnifying glass in between the solar light and the leaves and you position it in a certain way, the light is magnified, the solar energy is magnified through the magnifying glass. It becomes intensified and particularized through a certain point and then you can cause combustion with regard to the leaves. The solar energy output from the sun has not changed, but you simply took it and magnified it through a device and intensified its force at a specific place. And that's what's taking place. So when you have, hold on one second. Um, when you have shrines and so forth, that's what we're doing. Let 
second one. We load this page. All right. So the different cities that we visit and sacred shrine spaces and so forth, they are sacred spaces where the energy of specific divinities are intensified. When you go into these shrine spaces, and specifically us as Apurakani, Apurakani people, African Black people, when we go into a shrine space in ancient Kometa's city, a tomb, a temple, and so forth, the ancestral spirits, the Aku, Akutu, which is a term for ancestral spirits, the illuminated ones or shining ones, when the Aku, the Akutu, of course, who are connected to us Black people only, when we come into a shrine space, then those ancestral spirits come into that space. When Europeans are walking around and, you know, and non-Black individuals are walking around touring in ancient Kemet and so forth, our ancestral spirits are not going to come and take up residence in those spaces to communicate with the enemy. That has never taken place and it never will. But when we come in, they're already connected to us. We are the living shrines of the ancestral spirits, including those people who lived in ancient Kanye and Kemet. We are their direct descendants, spirit genetically. So when we come into a space, they're already connected to us by blood. They take up residence in these shrine spaces. When we come into a place, then the deities, Ra and Ra'et and Ka and Ka'et and Amen and Amenet and Mu and Mut and Nun and Nanet and Asar, Aset, Set, Nebethet and the various divinities, Wachet, Negabet, Segment and so forth, they take up residence in these shrine spaces when we come into the space. And that's, where, what, that's why there's a different experience when Black people come and visit these sacred spaces. So, so we talk about in the flyer, we say the manner in which the N Toro Tu, the goddesses, and the N Toru, the gods, the divine spirit forces in nature, fashion creation is reflected in the manner in which we fashion our spiritual selves as Afurakani, Afurakani people, African black people on every level, individual family, clan, communal. This is when we are grounded in our ancestral religion under the guidance of our Akutu Aku, as you can see here spiritually cultivated ancestresses and ancestors. There is no understanding of the value of life without a clear understanding of arikat, meaning the work of creation, cosmology. Our tour to Kemet and Kani, Egypt and Nubia will focus on the cosmology of the various sacred ritual sites. So we're gonna look at some of the places that we, we will be going um, and talk about what we experienced. So for those who are unaware, to date I've published 31 books on various aspects of Afro-Akani, Afro-Akani, African ancestry, religion, culture, um, ritual practice, nation building, and so forth. We've also um, conducted 38 online courses, and you can see those 38 courses. Let me just pull up that page real quick, including the Adi Kat course. On our Akongwa Suya page, you will see this is representative of the various um, flyers for the 38 courses and so forth. They are all archived, so you can access all of them. But you'll see the flyers for the various courses that we've taught, 38 different courses like Aperu, he Hebrews Never Existed, showing that the Hebrews are a fictional group and so forth, um, a nation, course on nation building. Ba'u, the seven spirits of Ra and Ra'et. Talking about the nature of the spirit, rest, the etymology, biology, cosmology, and divinity of race. But then we also talk about, um, for example, the Arikat course. We're talking about the different triads of divinities, not just Asara, Set, and Heru, as you can see here, but Amen, Mud, and Kain Su. Kunwem, Satet, Anuket, Banab Jedet, Hat Mehit, Heru Bukart, Pata, Bast, and Mahes, Main Tu, Tananet, Heru Bukart, and so forth. That's just one of the courses. So we have a number of different courses, 38 of them accessible online. You can access all of them online. All that information is on the page. So. Now let's look at some of the the list first, and then we'll look at the different, we'll go into some detail about showing some of the videos of where we've been. 
All right, hold on one second. All right. So Beru, the term for pyramids of Giza, Saqqara and Dashur, the necropolis there, uh, the museum in Cairo, Temple of Aset in Philae, Temple of, Temples of Ramesu II in Nefertari and Abu Simbel, which is ancient Nubia, the Nubian village in Aswan, uh, the Sobek Crocodile Temple in Kom Ombo, the Temple of Heru in Edfu, Temple of Seti in Abju, uh, so-called Abydos, Temple of Hederu in Dendera, the Mortuary Temple of Hatshepsut, Valley of the Kings, um, Temple of Amen, Amenet, and Mu in Aper Asut, Aper Reset, which is Sokal, Karnak, and Luxor. So let's look at what we're doing. So when you go on our Arikat page, you see the flyer for the upcoming trip. And then we also have the flyer for the September trip. But then you see we have a series of videos. And these 13 videos are from the most recent trip, um, a couple of scenes, this most recent trip from last May, and then a couple of them have some, you know, footage from the trip uh, previous to that in 13,021, the so-called 2021, but most of it comes from the most recent trip, most recent tour of 13,022, so-called 2022. So let's look at that. We went to the Museum in Cairo first, and let's look at the video for that. What was interesting, one of the many things there are 120,000 plus artifacts at that museum, and they've opened up a new museum and so forth. So, but one of the things that you will see amongst the many papyri and everything else are the bodies the mummified bodies of Tuya and Yuya, which are the parents of Amenhotep and the grandparents of Tutankhamen. So what happens is you see the actual, oh, let me scroll down. What you're looking at is the, when you go into the museum, the actual physical bodies of our direct blood ancestresses and ancestors that's never had carved on the shrine space on, on the uh, coffin itself. But for us, this is ancestral communication. This is not just somebody, you know, we're just looking at mummies. You have two parents, four great-grandparents, eight great-grandparents, 16 great-great-grandparents, 32 great-great-great, 64. You keep going 64, 128, 256, you know, um, 512, 1,024, 2,048, 4,096. And if you go back more generations, you have millions of Afurakani, Afurakani ancestresses and ancestors, great-grandparents. When we go back generations, we are directly blood-related to Tuya and Yuya. These are direct blood ancestresses and ancestors. These are our relatives. These are our great grandparents. And when you go and see their actual bodies, for us, it's no different than going to a wake or a funeral. And this is actually Tuya and Yuya on the papyrus and so forth. Um, they are funerary papyrus, the funerary papyr papyrus of Yuya. But once again, this is what we, this, this is inside the Cairo Museum on the very first day. When we arrive, we check into the hotel. Um, it's a 13 hour flight um, and we fly overnight and so forth. So most of that time is sleeping. But then once we arrive, check into the hotel and then the rest of the day we have, um, we go to the museum in Cairo and 120,000 plus artifacts, but this is one of those. one of those important um, experiences. So we're showing that as the mummy itself is an ancestral shrine. 
when we will mummify our deceased, there's a reason why we mummify the deceased. Whites and our spring are unaware of why we would go through the process of mummifying the deceased instead of just simply burying the deceased, going through this entire process. And what happens, that process, and when you look at what takes place and you see mummy wrappings undone and so forth thousands of years later, and it appears that the person was just you know, mummified a few years ago and you can't tell the difference that it's a 5,000 year old or 4,000 year old you know, mummy and so forth. We had a specific process where we were able to preserve the body in that, in that fashion for thousands of years. The reason why we do that is because we wanna take the body through a crystallization process. And once the body is crystallized, then that body is hardened or crystallized and so forth. And it becomes the greatest ancestral shrine for the spirit of the individual who used to reside in that body. Now, of course, you can place a picture on an ancestral shrine or you can have a sculpture that represents the individual on the shrine. You can have articles of their clothing and so forth. And that's a magnet for that spirit to come when you're pouring libation and engaging in ritual communication and so forth. But when you have the body of the individual itself, himself or herself, that has been preserved and literally turned into a crystal, crystallized through the mummified process or the mummy process, mummification process, and the body is turned into a crystal and it radiates the energy that the person used to radiate when they were operating through the body. That is the greatest magnet for that ancestral spirit, male or female, to be drawn back to the physical world in the context of ritual when we are communicating with this ancestor or ancestress. That's why we preserve the body to crystallize it, you know, harden it, so to speak, mummify it, but turn it into a crystal to make it a great ancestral trauma. So when we go and see Tuya and Yuya, this is an ancestral communication and their spirits come and take up residence in the dwelling space. So that's the first place we go. Now, the next morning we get up early and then we go to Sakara, where the Great Step Pyramid is. And then we go to and then we go to Giza as well. And you should be seeing the video right now. If you're not seeing the video, just let me know. If you have any issues seeing any images in the chat room, let me know. Okay. So in Saqqara, that is the earliest true pyramid and so forth, going back over 4,500 years ago. It's the step pyramid. They started building it in steps and so forth, the so-called Mastaba, or the first flat plane and so forth. And then another one on top, and another one on top. That was the first quote unquote true pyramid. And then eventually they began to build pyramids with the smooth size. Now, this is at the Giza, Plateau. And what's important to note for the Great Pyramid at Giza, originally it had smooth sides of white limestone, and then there was a pyramidion or a cap on top and so forth. But because of invasions, the white Arabs and so forth started stripping the limestone as well as the Europeans started stripping the limestone over the course of a thousand plus years and taking the limestone off of the pyramid and use that limestone to go build mosques and churches and so forth over the past uh, thousand years. So now you see that the pyramid is stripped bare, but originally white limestone, smooth sides all the way around, plus a black pyramidion or a black pyramid cap on top.
there are certain spaces, for example, in the Great Pyramid that you can go into one of the shafts up to a certain point. Um, they don't allow you to go all the way, you know, throughout the entire shaft system, but there's a couple of places where you're allowed to go inside to a certain point. And once again, this, these were shrines for the deceased, but they're also geodesic centers of earth and so forth. We place these great pyramids on certain regions of earth to capture the energy of that specific region of the earth mother's body. So they will call that geodesic centers and so forth, but shrines for the ancestral spirits to draw us back draw the ancestral spirit back, but also people engaged in ritual practice around, you know, that sacred space. So that's what we do on the second day. The first part of the day, we're going early in the morning to Sakara to the Step Pyramid and the Step Pyramid complex. There's also a Temple of Kagimni in that region, which was a, an official, and you see his temple and the relief carvings there, go to Sakara, and then in the afternoon, we go to Giza, and you see the Shesep and Ankh, and let's just pull that back up real quick. Okay. So of course, it's not the Sphinx. As you see in the video, it says Shesep Ankh or Shesep Ankh. That's the light of life and so forth, the illuminated light and so forth. That is the original title. And it's a shrine for the divinity Heru Emaket, so-called Heru Bekudet or Bedeti. He is called Benan Akan and Ogun and Yoruba and so forth. But that is the divinity Heru Bekudet or Bedeti also called Heru Emaket, and the sacred uh, animal totem is the Shesep Ankh. So of course we will be there, so you will see that as well. Now let's go to the next space. So that's the second day. And then after that, we fly from the Cairo region and we fly south in the evening and we go to Aswan, which is the dividing line between Kemet and Kanit, or Egypt and Nubia. And when we go to those, to that region, get up early in the morning, and the first place we go is to ancient Philae. Philae is a temple. Um, the Temple of Aset in Philae or on Philae and so forth. The Philae Temple, so-called Philae and so forth, the Philae. The ancient Temple of Aset, this, this was the final temple that was ordered to be closed by the Romans around 500 plus quote unquote AD. And a few years after that, they were trying to shut down the ancient ancestral religion and so forth, but a few years after that, the plague of Justinian hit Europe, the so-called plague of Justinian, and it shut Europe down for the next 500 plus years, sent Europe into a dark ages. So right after they ordered, or Justinian ordered that the, and sent out an edict that the final um, major shrine of the ancient ancestral religion of Kemet was to be shut down and closed, then Europe was hit with the plague, millions of people died, over the course of a couple of years, millions of people, just like the so-called Black Death or bubonic plague that happened in the 1300s in Europe, within five years, between one third and one half of the entire population of Europe, tens of millions of people dropped dead. That happened during the Black Death in the so-called 1300s, but uh, 700 years prior to that, seven to 800 years prior to that, the same thing happened the plague of Justinian around 542 AD and so forth, wiped out millions in Europe and sent Europe into the dark ages for the next 500 plus years. So, but we go to this ancient temple of Philae, Paraka, Pilak as it's called in, in, in Nubian, the Nubitu language, Paraka and so forth. 
and we go to the island where the sacred temple is. Second. So we talk about the Nubitu, the title Nubit is the origin of the name of the region. It's called Nubia by the Romans and so forth. But the Nubitu are the people in Aswan, the Southern Protectorate region. These are the Nubitu, the Nubians, they are still in Kemet. These are the founders of ancient Kemet, those who are still there. And they govern the, the boats and the shipping and so forth, or the ferries and so forth. They, they control that down there in the south. You can see people getting on the you know, boats and they get ferried across the river to get to the island because the island is in the midst of the river. You have to be ferried across by boat and so forth. But the Nubitu, the Nubians, we get on the boats and they take us to the island. But those of our people who remain in the southern part of Kemet, of course, some of us migrated away. And just like our people here, some of us migrated from the south and Mississippi and Alabama and so forth, up north to Detroit and Chicago and New York and different industrial sites, Milwaukee and so forth, but some remained in the south. These are some of the new couple of Nubian children on their little paddles. They paddled up next to the boat, singing their songs and so forth. Hold on a second, let me. But in the same fashion, some of our people stayed in the region, some of our people migrated away, but these are the people who stayed. We visit one of their villages. This is a home on one of the islands. We are ferried across the river went to one of the Nubian villages, the Nubitu villages, and went into the home. They opened their home to people and so forth. And then we can see they have turtles walking around inside their home complex. They have crocodiles living in the, in the, these are the heads of crocodiles. They have crocodiles living in the home and so forth. They raise crocodiles. You see them in the living room um, until they get to a certain age and then they release them into the river. So this is inside the house, inside the compound and so forth. And then when we get over to this, this portion, which is like, part of the living room area of the house, you see that they have the crocodiles living there. And this is something that goes back to ancient times. Just like we raise cats and domesticate cats and dogs and so forth, as well as horses, you see the young Nubitu youth standing on top of the crocodile. And when you see Heru, the child Heru standing on two, top of two crocodiles, that's not just symbolic of standing over the animal nature that you know, you have to control that powerful animal nature so you can operate in a harmonious way. It's a functional, deliberate, um, specific action. They're able to tame, quote unquote, or domesticate the crocodiles and live in harmony with this sacred animal totem. Sobek, the major animal totem governing the crocodile and so forth, the crocodile being his major animal totem that's a force in nature, so back the divinity. We've been in harmony with these deities for thousands of years. And you see this uh, crocodile is a sacred animal totem in ancient Khanid and Kemet. So back is the divinity. In the Akan tradition, the crocodile, Odenshim is the crocodile. He is sacred to the deity Bosom Afram as well as Bosom Pra in Vodun Ajakpa is the crocodile vodou, crocodile divinity and so forth. Same deity over the course of thousands of years still in our blood circles. So we, we go to um, the island, the sacred island and so forth. 
We go to the shrines in the Temple of Our Set, in Philae, we visit the Nubian village, and then we get on a road trip. And then that road trip, it takes us a couple of hours driving through the Nubi, Nubitu or Nubian desert so that we can cross the border from Aswan going into Kanik, going to in, into ancient Nubia. And the great temples of Ramesu II and Nefertari, where they call what they call Abu Simbel and so forth, that's where we're going. So, so here we are in front of the temple of Ramesu II, and then the temple of Nefertari is right next to that, sacred shrines, well-preserved temples and so forth. When you go inside, you'll see the, how well-preserved the images are, the you know, reliefs and so forth, many of the sculptures and so forth. This is ancient Nubia, this is ancient Kani. So we're just explaining in this particular area, we were talking about um, the fact that ancient Kani or Nubia is called the placenta land. The placenta, of course, nourishes the child while the child is in the womb until the child is old enough, mature enough to come out of the womb and delivery happens and the child is born and so forth. And then the child, you know, moves forward. So, but the placenta land, ancient Kani or Nubia, fed the younger nation, which later became Kemet, which later became Egypt. So the placenta land or Nubia is the foundation fed the young nation that will later become the great powerful nation of ancient Kemet. Now we want to show another piece from This was actually the first day, the first full day as well. When we went to Saqqara Step Pyramid and the Pyramid of Giza, right after going to Saqqara, you go to the Pyramid of the Per A, so-called Pharaoh Pepi from the sixth dynasty, 4,300 years ago. It's when this pyramid was built, this mayor was built and so forth. But we go into inside of the pyramid, inside of the Meru, you have to go down the shaft, a deep shaft, deep within the ground and so forth. About 20, 30 feet down, you go through that shaft, you have to bend over and so forth. And then when you get in the pyramid, get in the mare, then there are certain shafts that lead to the chamber where at one point, the body of the sovereign was buried, but his karasu, his coffin is still there. So this is inside the mare, the pyramid. You'll see that the pyramid texts on the walls, the oldest religious compositions on earth that have, that have been unearthed anywhere in the world, the oldest religious compositions are the Meru texts, the pyramid texts. This is the name Teti right here in the Shinu, so-called cartouche and so forth. But these are the pyramid texts. There are no older writings, not in Mesopotamia, not in India, not anywhere else no religious compositions anywhere in the world that are older than the Meru text, the pyramid text. And this is the coffin of Teti over 4,300 years ago. And we were allowed to briefly lie inside the coffin that he once lied inside and so forth. And of course, that is a form of ancestral communication. It's one thing to talk about that. It's another thing to get inside the coffin that he once laid in uh, 4,300 years ago and commune with his spirit. And once again, when we, when we come, the spirits come with us. Now, we also want to show you one of the things that we do once, once we get to Kani, 
Nubia, and we go to Abu Simbel and so forth. Um, and, you know, um, going to the temples and so forth. So that's all the way in the south, in the southern Kemet. Then we're going to visit the various cities on the way back north. So we visit the cities of the Crocodile Temple and so forth, the Sobek Temple in Kom Ombo, the Temple of Heru and Fu, the Temple of uh, Het Heru and Dendera and so forth. So we sail back up, you know, north. So let's look at a portion of that. I was just showing you a side. So we have, this is part of the cruise, which of course is part of the tour. And for a few days, you know, we, instead of driving, you can, you can drive from the South, drive, you know, for an hour or two and so forth, go to one of the temple sites, get back in the, um, you know, van or the bus and so forth, drive another couple of hours, go to the temple and so forth, or you can sail along the river stop at one of the sites, go in, get back on the boat, sail to the next city, and that's what we were doing. So we have a, a cruise that lasts for a few days, and we're sailing from city to city. So we're just showing in this video just to give you an example of what it, this is a, um, you know, a multi-tiered, boat and so forth, like three decks, triple decker boat and so forth, that's on the top deck and so forth. So. This is one of the stops that we make, the temple of Seti and Abju and so forth. One of the things that we do that some people don't do, you're sailing along the river and people stop at Homombo and so forth. They'll stop at the Temple of Heru and at Fu. Um, but in order to get to the Temple of Het Heru and Dendera, as well as the temple of Seti, which is a major important temple that's well-preserved and so forth, sacred shrine. You have to get off the boat and then you have to drive inland for about a, a couple of hours. So many people decide to just stay on the boat and go to other, you know, the other places because they don't want to take that extra trip. But for us, we do get off of the boat and we do, you don't make that extra excursion because it's very important, that sacred uh, shrine space, which is this particular one, this is one of them, the Temple of Seti and Abju, very important for understanding the cosmology of Kemet. The various divinities, Hapi, the male divinity of the river, Merit, the female divinity of the river, um, Ra, Atem, Atemet, Asasi Nebedetepet, Asasi Nebedetepet, the two earth mother divinities, Pataz, you can see here, um, Amen, Tuhuti, Ma'at, Sekmet, Mut, various divinities, very well preserved, sacred shrine, energy is very powerful. And what happens is because a lot of people don't take that excursion, they'd rather just stay on the boat and go to the um, temple sites that are closest to, you know, on the water and so forth. This is Asar and Aset. Um, when we go to this particular temple, typically it's, there's not very many people there. You can be in certain areas and maybe one or two other people in the entire temple. We have the whole space to ourselves. When we walk in the space, we can experience that energy for ourselves because there, there aren't a lot of people because they're not, they've decided that they would rather just, you know, go to the closest cities, closest temples and keep moving. But for us, these are sacred shrine spaces of our direct blood ancestresses and ancestors. And we wanna experience the energy. It's one thing to get the footage, of course, and you, get as, you can get as much footage as possible, 
we can spend you know enough time where you can take as many pictures and, and video and so forth as you need. But it's also most important to experience the energy of the Abosum, the divinities, as well as the Nsamanfo, the ancestresses and ancestors that are take up residence when we come into these shrine spaces. So that is the temple of Seti and Abju. Mm -hmm. Now we continue to go forward. Hold on a second, let me. And we get to the mortuary temple of Hatshepsut. You see that that temple is carved inside of a great mountain and so forth. Another one of the more well-preserved temples, Hatshepsut was a major queen mother. She wasn't the only queen mother, but she was a major queen mother, nation builder, defender of the nation and so forth. And her temple carved into a mountain, deep within the mountain and so forth. So when you go inside, you will see the great engineering works of our people, as well as the artwork and so forth, but the great engineering work. We had to be master mathematicians, engineers, and all, all manner of science. Every branch of science and so forth, we were already engaged in that thousands of years before Europeans even existed on earth, of course. We were already engaged in these kinds of sciences. So we're talking about her building for posterity and in the text um, on the so-called Tekken of Hatshepsut, she talks about how she wanted to build this sacred um, temple as well as the sacred Tekken, so-called obelisk or the sacred Tekken and so forth. And she stated that she was guided by her father, the deity Amen, to establish this and she wanted to do more than any of her predecessors ever did, but she was guided by her father, Amen. And she stated that men and women in a double Hinti period, a Hin period or a Hinti period, a Hin period in ancient Kemet was 60 years. Hinti is a double T Hin period, which is 120 years. And she was saying in that text that men and women in a Hinti period, meaning a double hen period, 120 years from now, meaning in successive generations, they would see what she built. And she built that under the guidance of the great God, Amen, her father, for us, her posterity, who will come generations later to see what she did. And of course, we read that text, but then we, we end up arriving at the space and fulfilling what she put down thousands of years ago her posterity, her descendants returning to the sacred shrine space so we can incorporate this ancestral wisdom and knowledge and take it back to our domiciles and so forth and implement that sacred order within our lives. We order ourselves physically and spiritually and culturally and communally and realign ourselves with divine order. So that's the sacred sanctuary of Hatshepsut. Now, when we go to the great temple of Apet Asedu, and you'll often see this name, Apet Asedu, or Apet Asud, or Ipet Isud, and so forth. They spell it different ways. But it is the shrine of the Apet and so forth, so called Karnak. And then within Karnak is Luxor, Apet Reset as well. So what you're talking about is the ancient 
sacred temple of Amen and Amenet and Mut. And then, of course, there are various divinities depicted in the temple and so forth. When they talk about the sacred temple complex of Amen, and it is Amen as well as Amenet, this is the largest religious com complex in the world. And what we said in this particular video, we called it Finding Amen and Amenet. This is one of the things that takes place with our tour that you don't find in any other tours and so forth until we started doing it. And now some people will incorporate this. But prior to us incorporating this information, which is critical, um, people were not, and they were unaware, but they were not incorporating this information. It's the great temple complex of Amen, but the great mother Amenet is also found in the temple. We talk about Amen, the great father, but Amenet is the great mother. The great mother and great father, supreme being who work together as one divine unit. People talk about Amen or Amen-Ra or the temple of Amen or Amen-Ra and so forth, but they were unaware of Amenet, the great mother. She is one half of all of creation. Without Amenet, there is no Amen. Without Amen, there is no Amenet. So if you don't understand who Amen and Amenet are, especially who she is, then you're imbalanced from the start. If you're talking about Amen and Ra and the deities without talking about Amenet and Ra'et and the goddesses and the gods and the ancestresses and the ancestors, you're imbalanced from the, from the cave. So we've always talked about the balance of Amen and Amenet, the great God and the great goddess who comprise the supreme being. In Akan, that's Nyame, which is Amen, Nyamewa, which is Amenet, the great mother and great father, the supreme being, and Yoruba, that is Olokun, who was the great mother, and Olorun, who was the great father, and so forth. In, in Vodun, that is Mawu, who's, who was the great mother, that's Amenet. Lisa is the great father. So when they say Mawu and Lisa, that is the great mother and great father, supreme being. We say Nyamewa, Nyame, the great mother and great father, supreme being. Amenet and Amen, the great mother and great father, supreme being. We are a people of balance, and we don't just say that. We actually incorporate them in ritual. We align our thoughts, intentions, and actions with Amen and Amenet. That's part of our ritual practice. So, so when you go into the temple, you see the the um. The path is lined by these rams and so forth, which are sacred to Amen. And there's a certain section of the temple on the pillars. As soon as you go inside, if you look up, this is Amen and this is Amenet. And they are together as they always have been. Divine Mother, Divine Father, and so forth. You see the name spelled in the Medutu, Amenet, as well as Amen, and so forth. So people have come to Kemet for, you know, for decades, doing tours and so forth, and they will walk up to one of these great columns. They will see Amen on the column. They will say, that is Amen, the great God. People will stand up under that column and take a picture. They won't even pay attention to the, this female divinity who's standing next to him, and they will go to the next relief and start talking about that because they didn't even know Aminet existed, but she's right there and her name is there. She's on multiple columns all throughout, you know, the temple complex, if you know where to look for her. But it's not just on the relief columns and these great columns are, you know, like trees, it's like a great forest of columns and so forth. But you find her on many of these different columns. Here she is once again. This is Aminet, as shown by her name right here, Aminet. And there's Amen, it's a little damaged on top where his crown is, but you can see his name spelled there. But then you also see these great statues, colossal statues of Amen and Aminet together. And those statues about 10, 15 feet tall. Colossal statues, one of the, you know, great preserved statues of Amenet 
in so-called karma, apet aset. And then once again, this is um, where we was in, in the temple in Apet Asetu, and we were talking about Amen and Amenet, and we were, before we went all the way in, we were introducing people to the fact that there's a balance of male and female, and this shrine is sacred. During this time, you would have hundreds and hundreds in ancient times of priests and priestesses working in the temple and so forth. This is where they copied the Vatican and these other temple complexes from in a very vulgar fashion. But these are the, this is the real temple, shrines of real divinities and so forth. And once again, when we enter these temples, that's when, these are when the spirits enter the temples as well. Now. I'm gonna show another piece to that. We also enter into the Valley of the Kings. And when you look at the Valley of the Kings, there are a number of different tombs buried. You go deep down underground and so forth. And there are tombs, a series of tombs, tomb complexes and so forth, where the various kings are buried. Ramesu the sixth, Ramesu the ninth, Ramesu the third, a number of different kings buried underground. So you go to the Tutankhamen and so forth. And when you go underground, go deep underground and so forth, long shaft, you have to walk down that long shaft and so forth. And once you get inside, you start seeing all of the reliefs and so forth, murals on the walls, as well as certain sculptures there. Um, this is where they were buried for a time before they removed the uh, coffins and some of them are placed in the museums and so forth. But, and some of them are very well preserved, like the tomb of Ramesu the Six is very well preserved. The tomb of uh, Ramesu the Ninth is well preserved in many respects, Ramesu the uh, third, well preserved. So a number of them. And Tutankhamen, his body is, is the only tomb in Kemet where they have the actual body still in the tomb. All, all the other bodies that they have preserved and so forth and captured, they placed in the museums or they still have in private collections. But Tutankhamen, his body is in the tomb. So when you go into the Valley of the Kings and go into the tomb of Tutankhamen and go down in there, you will see his body preserved right there. So this is uh, the tomb of Mer and Fatah. And then you see how well preserved the reliefs are. That's the particular text called the Litany of Ra when they talk about 75 deities who are forms of Ra and so forth, children of Ra and so forth. And you find that text, but this is the actual, where they got the text from. That's the deity Ptah with the solar disc on his head and so forth. That form of Ptah with the solar disc on his head is where they get the entire notion of the um, fictional character Buddha. They got it from the god Ptah. When they talk about Buddha, the shining illuminated face, the illuminated one and so forth. This is Pata, the divinity deep within the core of earth, deep within your core and so forth. He's the illuminated one who fashions forms according to the dictates of Ra and Ra, the creator and creatress of divine order. He's the illuminated one. He's the one that fashions all thought forms and, and actions in harmony with divine order. So this is where they get Pata the one who fashions forms, behavioral forms and thought forms in harmony with quote unquote illumination. So that's one of the things we talk about. Of course, we talk about how the various characters, um, Jesus, Yeshua, Yahshua and so forth, Abraham, Isaac, Ishmael, Solomon, Sheba, Menelik, Moses, Aaron, David, Solomon, Muhammad, 
Allah, Yahweh, Buddha, Brahman. These are fictional cartoon characters who never existed of any form or of any race whatsoever. It's all fraudulent foolishness. And they stole fragments for our ancestral religion and culture and corrupted them into these fake characters who never existed. So we go into that in, in our books and then you see the evidence of that when we go, go on this tour. Hold on one second, I just wanna. Just want to make sure I didn't miss one of those. Hold on a second. Okay, so there's one other video we want to show you real quick. Okay. Now, this is one of the, um, this is a space or a place that for us that we go to, that we were able to get access to, that other tours are even unaware of. So, and we'll be going back to that you know, in May, this specific space, as well as in September. We had to get special permits to get into this specific temple, the temple of Kane Su, and that temple complex is under construction and renovation. So you have to get special permits. If some, something is, you know, under construction or renovation, it's not open to the public. So you have to get special permits in order to see that. Um, but the reason why we, we asked for a special permit for this, and that you know is an extra cost as well. But the reason why we asked for a special permit is because we knew what was inside of this particular temple complex. Since many of our people were unaware, because Europeans typically don't focus on certain deities because of this you know Eurocentric patriarchal mindset, because they don't focus on them when they're writing about these you know deities and so forth and the culture then our people tend to follow along with them and then they don't focus on it. But we do focus on it because these deities are the same deities we invoke in the Akan tradition, the Hoodoo tradition in North America, the Voodoo tradition in North America, the Juju tradition in North America and so forth. And wherever black people are in the world, we still invoke these divinities. We talk about Ra the creator of the universe, but the Ra'et is the creatress of the universe. And in the temple of Kane Su, there's a major sacred image of our set, a great relief of our set in one of the shrine spaces and so forth. And we ask for special permission, permits and so forth to get to that space. And, this, and we will visit that space. And we're the first quote unquote African-Americans to go to the temple of Kane Su and go to this shrine space and for people in our families, this is the first time we've reconnected with this shrine space in thousands of years since our people first built it. And this is Ra'et, it's shown by her name, Ra'et Tawi. Some people will see her headdress, the solar disc between the two horns and assume that must be Het Heru or even maybe Aset. But as you can see, her name is spelled with the solar disk and the T, that's Rat or Ra'et. And Tawi talking about she governs the Tawi, the two lands. And she's the Arit Ra or the creatrix of Ra, the wife of Ra and so forth. The one who creates Ra. And this is Kain Su, Kain Su Nefertep Heru. That's the temple he's in and she's in that temple. And she's, we also show that she is 
you can find right at as well on the great columns in so-called Karnak and Luxor, Aped Asetu and Aped Reset. Once again, our people will walk right by those pictures, walk right by those columns. They'll see Ra'et right up on the columns, but they won't recognize as her. They'll see the solar disk and the crown and, and solar disk between the um, horns and the sum because Het Heru wears that headdress and sometimes I'll set as well. They'll say that, well, that must be Het Heru and even we'll say that's Het Heru. And it's actually Ra'et, the creatress of the universe, Ra is the creator. In Yoruba, Ra is Odumare, and Ra'et is Oshumare, the rainbow serpent that swallows her tail. In Vodun, Da is the rainbow serpent, and Aida Huedo is the female rainbow serpent that's the creator and great dress. Da and Aida Huedo is Ra and Ra'et. In Akan, Nyonkompon is the creator of the universe, and Nyonkonton is Ra'et, the creatress of the universe. We have always invoked Ra and Ra'et, the creator and creatress. They are the divine living energy that animates all created entities in creation, including us, Afurakani Afrakani people, and Afurakani Afrakani people, African Black people only. So you can't have creation without this female divinity. You can't have creation without the creatress, that divine living solar fire that animates all of us, the divine link of energy from us the plant life, animal life, mineral life, other Afrakani, Afrakani people, as well as the spirits of the ancestral spirits and deities, that divine living energy that permeates all of creation, that gets inside of our spirit body and physical body and so forth. That is the energy of Ra and Ra'ed, and we communicate directly with these forces to intensify that energy within us, within us for healing, as well as communication, for protection, and so forth. So. A second, just want to check something. Okay. So that is the, those are the visuals we wanted to show you just to take you through some of the different temple sites, cities, We'll be traveling to 12 different cities from Northern Kemet, you know, Cairo and so forth, and um, the Giza Plateau and so forth, and then going down to Kanik Nubia and traveling up through Edfu and Kom Ombo and um, um, Abju and Dendera and Apet Raset, so called Luxor, and, you know, Apet Asetu Karnak and so forth going to all these different places, sacred shrines, temples, tombs, gathering this information, but also experiencing the energy of the Abu Soman and Samantha, the deities and ancestral spirits. Now, uh, of course, if you have any questions in the chat room, or we're also, of course, on YouTube. So if you have any questions or comments, you can put them in the chat. But to give that breakdown, you see the flyer. Our goal was to make our trip as inexpensive as possible, the most cost-effective as possible. What you'll find is that most people charge between 3,800 and 4,200, some charge more and so forth. Um, but we're all going to the same cities. We're all you know, taking those similar cruises and so forth. Um, so they're not going to any special places that other people are not going to. So we were able to get our trip for 3000. We have payment plans available. Now, one thing that we were able to do, and we sent this out via email. So if you have not received, if you're not on the email list, you need to get on the email list. Um, just, you know, just email us and we'll put you on the list and so forth. But we had, we did this for the May trip. Um, this, this coming up May trip and so forth. And 
we're doing it again for the trip in September. We had a couple of spaces um, for the May trip for 50% off. So instead of 3,000, it was 1,500. And the stipulation is you would, um, you would either pay the, the entire fee, you know, registration up front, or you can pay half of it and then within two weeks pay the other half. And you know, we had a couple of spaces like that for the previous trip, this May trip that we we're about to go on. And then we did the same thing. We were only able to do a few, a few spaces for that for the September trip. We had like four spaces. Um, a couple of people took a couple of spaces, but we have a couple of spaces left for the 50% discount. So once again, instead of paying 3,000 for the trip in September, September 26th through September, through October 4th, it's uh, 1,500 for the discounted spaces that first come, first serve. Of course, as most people know who come to our site and know about our work, our trip is open to Afurakani, Afurakani people, African Black people exclusively. So we only go and travel with our own people. So, um, so we have a couple of spaces open right now for the $1,500 space. That means it's round trip airfare from JFK International Airport in New York. Um, so that, that cost includes the round trip airfare, the four flights is round trip, plus there's the flight from Cairo to um, Aswan to Nubi and so forth, that round trip flight. And, you know, going there and then coming back and so forth. And then also we fly down to Nubi, Nubi and so forth, get on the uh, boat for the next few days, sail up the river and stop at each city. But then when we get back to the region of Karnak and Luxor, Aped Asetiu, and Aped Reset, after we go to those temple complexes, we fly back from Luxor to Cairo on the final day so that we can leave Cairo and go back, you know, come back home. So that's why we say there are four flights. It's the round trip airfare from JFK to Cairo and of course back home, but also the internal flights going from Cairo to Nubia and from Luxor to Cairo. So uh, 13 individual sites in 12 cities, a five-star cruise, um, five-star hotels. That includes, for example, when you're in Luxor, the Luxor Hilton, you know, the hotels are similar to the ones that we have here and so forth. Um, we have a special access, and we're talking about the, in this, this trip, the access to the Temple of Kain Su that we have to get special permits for and so forth. Um, we have vegetarian and vegan meal options. So, and then this is the list of the various places that we, that we go to. We do have double occupancy, which is 3,000. Single op occupancy, meaning if you, you want to have your own room, you don't want to, you know, room with someone, then it's an extra fee for that. Um, and then you see all the, the policies and so forth, including dealing with passports. There are no vaccinations um, that you need to have to go to combat. You don't have to deal with that. Vaccinations, of course, the whole COVID thing is over with, but they never required a COVID vaccination to go to combat. But um, you had to take, you know, the tests and so forth, but that's done with. So there are no test requirements for that. And then for vaccinations in general, you don't have to have a vaccination to go into combat which is different from going to like Ghana or Nigeria or Togo Benin, some, some region of West Afrika, Afrika, you have to have the yellow fever vaccine in order to enter the country, but to go to Kemet, which is not in an equatorial tropical region, it's, it's Northeastern Afrika, Afrika, so it's different. So you don't have to have any vaccine for that. Passports, um, a passport with at least six months validity beyond the intended stay. So September um, uh, 26th through October 4th. So you have to have a passport that has at least, it can't be a passport that expires on October 5th. It has to be a passport that has six months of validity beyond October 4th. So 
if you don't have six months of validity beyond October 4th, then you can, you know, apply for a passport. You can do it at the regular, you know, regular speed, or you can expedite it and get it within a week or two and so forth. There are different ways to do that. All right. So, and we have, you know, different policies and things like that. All that information is there. No. Okay, so if you have any questions in the chat room, of course, you can post them. We just wanted to let people know about the trip and let people know about the 50% um, discount for a couple of spaces. We have a couple left when we first announced that a couple of weeks ago, two of those spaces were taken. So we have two more left. Um, and we can, if you didn't get that email, if you weren't on the list, we can send you the email for that. Um, you know, with the details, but basically what we were saying is um, $1,500 is 50% off, but you have to either pay the full 15 up front or half of it up front as a deposit to take that space. And then the other half within the next two weeks, um, because you know, we only have two spaces and those go kind of quickly. At this point, we're only, to, only able to offer that to a, for a couple of spaces. Eventually, you know, over time, we may be able to have it open for 10 spaces. But right now, we, we can only, you know, afford to give a couple of those spaces away. So we have two of them left over. Okay. Okay, so let me also put this information out there as well. So the books that we have published, I've published 31 books to date. All of the ebook versions of our books are free downloads from our website. So when you go to the home on page on our website, you will see all of the book covers. And when you click on the book covers, you will, you know, go directly into the ebook. So when you look at Cuckoo Tsun Tsun, for example, um, we talk about The origin of the fictional characters, Abraham, Isaac, Ishmael, Moses, Aaron, David, Judah, Solomon, Sheba, Menelik, Jesus, Mary, Muhammad, Yeshua, Ben Pandera, Allah, Yahweh, all these fictional characters, Buddha, Brahman, and so forth, how they were manufactured from our ancestral religious practices. They were deliberately corrupted. They took fragments, the Europeans, the invaders took fragments of our cosmology to manufacture these little fictional characters to make our people worship fictional characters or align with fictional characters. So we will be aligning with them, our enemies, as opposed to, as opposed to our own ancestral religious practice. So we deal with that and just the cosmology of creation in general. That's one of the texts, um, Uben Shang dealing with ancestral ritual, like ritual song, ritual dance, ritual prayer, libation, ancestral shrines, the various ritual practices that we engage in, what their natural uh, cosmological functions are. We don't engage in any ritual practice in ancestral religion that is purely symbolic. We have to be receiving, processing, or transmitting energy in some fashion, or else we don't engage in ritual. We don't just have empty symbolic rituals with no functionality. We show what that is in that particular book. Afuraka, Afuraka, the origin of the term Africa. We show etymologically and cosmologically the origin of the term and so forth. Um, Maranichi, divine law, love, and divine hate, the expansive and contractive poles of divine order. The Okra, Okra complex, the nature of the soul, the divine consciousness, the deity that governs the head. And so when you look at our various books, the womanhood book, the manhood book, and various books. Um, we go into detail on a, lot, on a lot of different subjects and so forth. And then we also have, as we mentioned earlier, our Akongwa Suya page, the 38 online courses, and now they are all archives, six-week courses, 
four week courses and a couple of seven week courses, because they are archived now, video archives, then you will see that they are 50% off. So the six week courses that were $30 for the six week course, now they are $15 for the six week course. Those four week online courses that were $20 are now $10 for the four week online course. And so you'll see when you scroll down the original flyers for each course, for example, we just, just completed recently the Kane Sim course talking about authentic numerology, numbers associated with actual deities, not the misinformation that's put forward about numerology by Europeans and so forth and pseudo metaphysicians, but this notion of deities associated with specific numbers, deities that are connected to our spirit genetic blood circles as Akurakani Afrakani people. We talk about that in, in context, proper context. We just completed that six week online course it was 30 weeks when it, $30 when it was, you know, live as a six week course. Now it is archived. So it is 15, it's 50% 50, 50 off. So when you pay 15, we'll send you the links and passwords to the entire six week course. And that includes, you know, the videos, you know, each, each week was about hour and a half to two hours. And then of course, when we're talking about the specific books that we're covering, it includes many of the 31 books that you can download for free that we're examining and so forth. And the same is true with our various courses. The four week course we did on Aperu, Hebrews never existed, showing that the whole Hebrew story is a fiction. There were no group of Hebrews, black or white, that existed in ancient times as a fabrication. They corrupted a story from the book of the cow of heaven, which is inscribed on the wall inside the temple uh, or tomb of two Anka men, as well as Seti and other tombs and so forth. You will see that in Kemet and so forth when we travel there. But that's a major text that they stole from to manufacture that story. Of course, on nationism um, and a number of different, many different topics. The Arikat course, we have parts one and two, talking about the triads of deities in these different temple cities. So this is one of the courses parts one, 101 and 102 that you will want to study prior to um, the trip. So when we're going to these temples and we're talking about these different divinities, you'll be aware of who we're talking about. Of course, we're going to go over that while we're there, but you, you'll be aware ahead of time. We have the 13 week, week womanhood course that was taught by Ama Ma'ati that's available. We have the 13 week manhood course that I taught based on my book, Obedi Ma Afrakani Manhood, that is available. That's Arika Par One, Cosmology of Creation. Um, Toro Tu Seneb, the bio-spirituality of the goddesses. Talking about the shrines in the body that these deities govern, like the thorac, thorax, thoracic cavity and so forth, or the um, pharynx or the larynx, the epiglottis, these different parts of the body, the pericardium and so forth, um, the cervix, uh, all these different parts of the body and so forth, the auditory system, we show that these different female divinities governing these different shrines, physiological shrines, biological shrines in the body. We have our book, on the origin of the term yoga, Karakasa, the origin and nature of the chakra. So these terms, yoga and chakra or kakra come from Yonk, which was corrupted into Yonka and Yunka and Yoga and so forth, but Yonk or Ankh and Kara Kara in Ejikamet is the origin of Yoga and Chakra and so forth. So we show the origin of these things and how they were corrupted later in Hinduism and Buddhism and so forth. And then we have a number of different courses on the Hoodoo tradition, which is our consciousness religion in North America, um, a number of different courses that we have. So, But okay. Okay, so if there are no questions, um, we'll go ahead and end it here. But if you haven't, we will save this. We will upload this on the YouTube channel for those who didn't get a chance to see the whole thing. Um, of course, if you have any questions, you can hit us up on our Arikat page on the website. And once again, this is the Arikat page. Arikat Clement. 
adikakomet.com and all of the information is there. And of course you can email us at kwesiakon at gmail.com and we'll answer any question that you have. But we look forward to connecting with everyone on this trip. And we also showed this, one of the videos that you saw that we posted here, the tech video. This video is just talking about the nature of um, the term tech, which is a term, origin of the term tax and so forth. But many people will use their tax return, tax refunds and so forth to fund a portion of the trip or part of the trip. And then the rest, of course, we have payment plans where you can pay monthly, you know, all the way through. So you can, you know, pay it in installments. You can make your own payment plan. You just pay monthly until you pay off the entire trip. There's also one thing we want to show on the page. When you see the PayPal section here, there's a pay later section. So of course, PayPal has this, this um, option called pay later, where if you're approved for that, they'll approve you for either the entire trip or part of the trip. So if they approve a portion of it, if they approve the whole thing, for example, you may pay $70 a month for you know 20 months and so forth until you pay off the entire trip. So instead of paying the whole thing up front, they'll finance the portion of it is no different than like a credit card or a line of credit, so more like a line of credit. That's what pay later in PayPal is. And you've seen that, you know, if you're making now very often they have that on as an option for, you know, flights, if you're traveling or, you know, different products that you purchase on Amazon or different sites and so forth. Very often they have the pay later option. Um, and the same thing with regard to this trip, you, some people will you qualify for that. You can either put the entire trip on pay later, and you may pay seventy or eighty dollars a month for twelve to twenty-four months and so forth, or they may approve, you know, a smaller portion, and you can utilize that, and then you can make um, payments to pay the balance. So, okay. Okay, so once again, so Yerase, we thank everybody for tuning in and Yebeshi Abio, we will meet again. That's it.